Okay, great. Um, well, awesome. I just I want to just start by welcoming everyone to our webinar about the Stanza Minerva Baccalaureate. And um, let's just just so you know who you got right here. My name is Dr. Caprice Young. I'm the superintendent of Stanza International Academy, and I've been an educator for more than 20 years. And gosh, that I can't believe I said that out loud, but it's true. And what comes along with 20 years in education is every year I've been in this industry, I have uh, imagined if I could just do it any way I want to really give the students what they need, what would it be? And so that is my reason for, um, for offering students the Stanza Minerva Baccalaureate because it is the way I've always wanted to do it. And um, I'm very, very, very pleased to introduce my, my uh, partner in education here, Dr. Mark um, Siskin, who is uh, the leader at Minerva with whom we are partnering to provide this great experience to students. Mark, why don't you give us a couple of uh, sentences about your bio and background? Sure, um, I'm a professor at Minerva University where I teach college students and graduate students. I'm also a research affiliate at Yale University and MIT, where I study teaching and learning and developmental psychology in general. And I'm incredibly excited to have joined with uh, the high school program uh, that Minerva is now doing in conjunction with Stanza, uh, bringing to high school a lot of what we've been doing at the college level um, and I look forward to showing everyone here a bunch of what that looks like and discussing it, answering questions uh, over the next 45 minutes. Okay, so let me just start by saying um, every solution, you know, started with someone having a vexing problem that needed to get solved. And, um, and so I, I'm going to start with a kid. Uh, that, that kid, her name is Roxy. And she was a student who loved arts and was brilliant at the arts, uh, but also was dyslexic and needed um, something that would engage her intellect, engage her artistic side, and also address the kinds of challenges that she faced being dyslexic. And her high school, her public high school, um, was an arts-focused high school and um, it was small, so they couldn't offer a lot of the things that she needed. And the most important thing that they couldn't offer was um, something that was multidisciplinary and really engaging in um, not just having her doing a lot of writing, but also having her become um, really engaged with her peers and thinking about ideas that transcended social science and uh, hard sciences and transcended math um, to really be the big, the big skills that one needs to be successful. And I wanted to be able to provide that for her because the students that I met as an undergrad at Yale, and Mark and I do have the, the Yale connection in common, the, the thing that, that a lot of Yaleys have in common is not just that they are brilliant in physics or brilliant in history, but that they know how to think across different subjects. And I know a lot of us as parents have been thinking over the course of this last year much more deeply about our own children's educations because we're seeing it up close and personal. And, and one of the crises that has happened during the pandemic is that traditional schools who are used to doing the in-person teaching tried to go remote. And when they went remote, all they did was take everything that they were doing in person and throw it online. And mostly that didn't work. Um, the other thing that I've seen is online programs that are just online. And, and by that, I mean that a student will log in to the to the program and they'll do all of the reading and they'll watch all the videos. They'll have almost no interaction with anybody. They'll turn in the work and that's it. And that's kind of equally disheartening for the students. And 
that's been even true of really advanced programs like international baccalaureate programs and, and AP programs. Both of those programs were programs that were created for an in-person experience and then kind of bolted into, into a remote experience. And, um, and what I wanted for the students at Stans International Academy is something that takes the technology that exists today and really leverages that technology for deep thinking, for profound interaction that is both real time and also supports the students' independent learning. And, and that is how we got to Stanza's Minerva Baccalaureate Program. We wanted that kind of program that is for the students who have tremendous ambition and, um, and who want to be able to have a, a deep learning experience. Now, some families during this pandemic, they've tried tutors, others have tried homeschooling. I mean, I think probably I could ask every person watching this webinar and you've all probably tried some, um, probably lots of different things. And I believe that what we've got here is the best solution. And that's why I am so excited about it. And so what we, when we talk about um, online learning being your plan A, uh, it is because a lot of uh, families have learned that by moving online, they can actually have the plan A for their education instead of thinking about it as plan B, right? So let me tell you a little bit more about what we're doing here in solving this really vexing problem. Um, so first of all, we've taken a curated approach. What I mean by that is, um, is that every single student who enrolls with Stanza International Academy is treated absolutely individually. We, um, we sit down figuratively, it's online, with the students and parents and find out about, find out about your kid. Um, what does your student love? What are they interested in? What are they passionate about? What really bores them? What are they really good at? What do they, um, what do they want in their education, but not just in their education, in their life? Not, you know, one of those difficult questions of what do you want to be when you grow up, but things like what kind of impact do you want to make? How do you want to be spending your time? Who do you want to meet? Who do you want to hang out with? What, uh, what kinds of people do you respect? What work do you want to be doing? We ask those questions so that we can curate a great academic experience. And that is, that's a, a key piece of it. Now the, the, Stanza, Mag, uh, the Stanza Minerva Baccalaureate is a four-year program. It got to start at the beginning of the program. I, um, and that has been, that's been really important because it builds, right? So a student will start with us in ninth grade and it'll build all the way up. And within three years, they will have completed the baccalaureate and their high school diploma, but then we keep them for another year and they do a full year of college and get Minerva College credit for that full year of college. Now, some students who are enrolling with us are going even further and saying, well, I don't wanna just wait and do college my last year. I wanna do college level courses all the way through. And so we have a partnership with Arizona State University to be able to allow students to be able to get Arizona State University credit or AP credit for the same courses that are part of the Minerva Baccalaureate all the way through it. Sounds, sounds complex, but it's really not. And we'll explain through this as we go along. We consider this to be basically a purpose-built education. And, um, and being purpose-built education means having the flexibility tailor it to exactly what your students want and need. And when, um, when you think about your kid, think about a student-led education is really part of what you want for your student. Now, your student may not right now be someone who thinks of themselves as I'm leading my own education. That's okay. We're gonna cultivate that feeling um, with your student so that they take control of their education, so they own their own education and wanna move forward with it so that um, by the time they get to college, they're not just ready for college, it's old hat. They've already done college, 
um, or at least college level courses. So there's no fear and they can actually just really, really focus on, um, on getting the best college education they can and really excelling. So that's, um, that's a, a little bit of how I wanted to start. And maybe I'm gonna stop talking for a minute, let Mark take over and, um, and tell you more about the guts of the Minerva Baccalaureate. Awesome, thank you so much. I will uh, start with a 30 second story, but then I want to very quickly uh, start sharing my screen and start showing everyone exactly what this looks like. Uh, pictures worth a thousand words. I even have lots of videos to show, which I assume are worth even more than a thousand words. Uh, so here's my 30 second story. I was for several years uh, teaching full-time at Yale, uh, teaching college students uh, about cognitive science was my full-time job. And I heard about Minerva and it sounded too good to be true. And so then in fall of 2018, I worked out my contract so that I could do a little bit less at Yale and I could teach one course with Minerva University. Uh, and based on that experience, I then switched over full time uh, for the next year. And as I mentioned, I still have a research affiliation with Yale where I do uh, cognitive science research on teaching and learning. Um, but my teaching is now centered on Minerva University. And so what I wanna do now is I will start sharing my screen and I'll start showing you what this looks like and telling you why I find it exciting. Uh, I will be relying uh, on Dr. Young and also various other people who are watching this in the Q&A um, to interrupt me, uh, ask questions, ask for more detail, tell me uh, what I've said that isn't clear, uh, have a discussion. Because one of the big things is that as a Minerva teacher, I do not give long lectures. Uh, that's not great for learning. Uh, instead, you want to have as much engagement as possible. Uh, so I'll start off by presenting this, uh, but I look forward to whatever Q&A and discussion uh, starts taking over. Uh, so to begin with, I will share uh, the main interesting parts of this video. Uh, so now on your screen, and Dr. Young, give me a thumbs up if, if you're seeing awesome. Uh, you're seeing uh, an actual Minerva class or rather I should say an actual Minerva classroom. Uh, these are uh, students who are acting for the purposes of this video. Uh, we would never be just you know, taking educational material and sharing it out into the world. There are laws about that. So I wanna start off by saying that, um, that uh, this was something that I recorded with some Minerva college students who were excited to share what uh, a Minerva class looks like. Uh, so on Thursday of last week, uh, I sat down with them. We recorded a sample high school class. They had a lot of fun uh, revisiting their high school years. Um, and so this is the video that we got from that. And the first thing I want you to notice is the top bar. At the top of the screen, you see me in the very upper left, kind of small, um, and then every other student in the class. There's no back row, everyone is in the front row. Um, and uh, there's different emotional reactions people can do, uh, thumbs up and happy faces and confused faces, uh, but everyone's always there engaging. Actually, the, 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 the emoji that I love is that, uh, that Minerva has is the, the mind blown emo emoji. It's like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's like this hierarchy of like how excited students get about things. There's like, you know, kind of just like, oh yeah, like, happy and then there's like the oh like snap and then there's like the mind blown which uh if if ever i blow any students minds i'm so happy and and they'll uh give that reaction to each other as well uh, if they're particularly mind blown about something um underneath this bar is the main part of the classroom and right now it's set so that there is a slide that we're all looking at to introduce the class for the day uh what we're going to be discussing and then there's my image and three other students. And something that might not be immediately obvious is unlike, for example, Zoom, where we are now uh, for this webinar, um, in this Minerva forum classroom, everyone is seeing exactly the same thing. Uh, so if I, as the teacher, want us to be focused just on that slide on the left, I could change it so that that's the only thing that appears. If I wanted it to be the slide and me and no one else, I could have that be the case. 
Um, and then everyone is seeing exactly what they're supposed to be seeing uh, for that moment in class time. So here we are at the beginning of class. I've got me and a few students up there. We chat about the goals for the day. And this is going to be a, uh, a literature class, uh, ninth grade English, in which we're going to be talking about a particular concept, audience. And when I get to discussing the way the Minerva Baccalaureate curriculum is put together, I'll mention a lot of things about why this has a hashtag Twitter symbol in front of it, like hashtag audience uh, and the role that plays. But for the moment, I just want uh, everyone to pay attention to the classroom experience. We're focused on audience today. Uh, how do authors prepare material uh, to be relevant for their audience? And this is a super foundational skill. Um, in fact, I'm trying to use it right now. I'm thinking about who is in the audience of this webinar. What do you most want to know? Um, what, uh, how much do you want to hear me talk about audience? Uh, what's the best way to frame this? Um, so that's, that's the goal of, of this day, uh, of this class. Start yeah. introducing that concept. Yeah. Let me just interrupt you a sec. Um, one of the things that I love about Minerva is that a lot of these concepts transcend one particular discipline. So can you maybe give an example of how somebody who is in a hard science, who's maybe doing a lab report, might be thinking about the concept of audience? Absolutely. And, and I realized I was going to, you know, blast through this point and, and not talk, talk about this. But no, this is exactly what we should talk about now. Um, so the classes are always going to be focused on specific learning outcomes. Some of them will be specific to the subject. You're in a biology class, there's learning outcomes about biology. You're in a math class, there's learning outcomes about math. But then there are also learning outcomes that exist across all of the subjects. An audience is one of those. So it's being introduced here um, in uh, the context of an English literature class. But as, as Dr. Young just said, uh, this will show up in the other ones as well. For example, a lab report in a science class where you might be thinking, I'm writing up the method section of my uh, of my study. How much detail goes in that? Well, that's going to necessarily depend on your audience. Are you writing this method section to be followed by other experts who have done exactly this sort of scientific experiment before? Or are you writing it for someone who has never done this sort of scientific experiment before? Depending upon who you identify as your audience, for the method section that you're writing in this scientific report, you'll end up going into very different amounts of detail. Uh, you might use specific fancy jargon words without defining them if you're writing for experts, uh, but you would define them or avoid them if you are writing for people who weren't experts. And a core part of the way the Minerva program is put together is that these same learning outcomes appear across the different subjects. And all of the teachers are aware of them. All of the teachers are talking about them, highlighting how they're used in these different areas, helping you see how they apply across your life, uh, inside and outside of every subject. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why this is sitting here in minute number one of the class, saying this is what we're focusing on today. Um, let's all pay attention to this. We'll learn about it as it relates to our English literature class, but we'll also be uh, building up the foundation for applying it elsewhere. So after we have this discussion and I might be asking different students some questions, I might be getting them to vote thumbs up or thumbs down on different ideas, uh, getting them to debate with each other, uh, we move on. And um, as we move on, uh, we start doing some activities. So here is this activity, and I'll, I'll tell it to you the same way I told it to the students, which is this is the cover of a book. Imagine that it's a book that you wrote. It, it can be whatever you want it to be, but you've written this book, and this needs to be the picture on the cover. Think about what audience you want to sell your book to, and what title would you give the book to sell it to that audience? So those are the two key things to be thinking of. Who am I selling this book to? 
and then what should I make the title? And having asked the students that question, they fill in an on-screen poll about this. And at first, as the answers come in, I'm the only one who sees them as each individual student uh, puts them in. But then in this class, what I decided to do was actually show all of the answers to all of the students. And I asked them to read through each other's answers and then discuss whose other answer they liked and why. And so after they have a moment to do that, uh, I start asking them, uh, okay, Brittany, tell us whose answer did you think was interesting and exciting? Uh, and she chose Jesse's answer. And so I featured Jesse's answer on the screen. And Brittany describes why she thinks this was an interesting combination of title um, and audience. Uh, and some of you might be on a screen where uh, you can't uh, read the tiny size, uh, you know, if you're watching this on a cell phone, for example. Uh, so I'll tell you, Jesse's answer was, uh, he would title his book, The Departure, um, and he wanted to attract young adults who are interested in realistic historical fiction. Uh, and so when I called on Brittany, she selected Jesse's answer as the one that caught her eye, and she explained why she thought that was a good title for that audience. Uh, moving on with the activity, I Wait, then revealed- I'm oh, yeah. you pause again, because here's the thing that I want, oh gosh, all of you who are parents who have lived this frustrating year, where you've watched, you know, where you've watched your 15 year old zone out in front of the remote learning with the teacher trying heroically to impart um, some information, but it's all about the teacher talking, 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 and the students are sleeping, 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 or even trying to get it, but just bored or disengaged. And I hope what you're seeing here is there is just no way to zone out in this class. It's online, it's synchronous, and it's super engaging in ways that students are actually not used to being engaged. As Mark said at the beginning, you can't hide in the back. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll, I'll even add some, some actual numbers to that, which is most of the class sessions are put together so that the teacher is probably not talking for any more than 30% of the time. 70% of the time is the students engaging with each other. And that's expertly moderated by the teacher and by the activities that the students are doing together. Um, but in the same way that you might have a coach for a soccer team or a football team or a basketball team off to the side helping the players to achieve their goals, but it's the players who are doing all of the stuff. That's how this classroom experience is put together. Uh, the teacher is the coach. Mark, in order for in order for anyone to understand that, though, you've also got to understand the concept of flipped classroom because, you know, as a parent, I might say, "Well, that's great. I'm glad they're interacting with their peers, but the peers don't know the subject any better than they do. I want them to be learning from somebody who actually knows the subject." So they're learning the, the stuff, you know, and, and the, the flipped classroom piece of this is an important thing to understand. Can you just tell us for a minute about the flipped classroom idea? Absolutely. Um, so the idea of the flipped classroom is you come into the class time having done the basic work to know the foundational information. And instead of then coming into class and having the teacher say a bunch of information to you, that's already been done. Um, just like you can sit in a Zoom room and watch a teacher say some information to you, uh, you can watch a YouTube video that they've recorded ahead of time where they say some information. And then you can watch that when it's convenient for you. You can rewatch it if you realize you missed some important information. You can watch it at half speed uh, if you're trying to work through some tricky aspect of it. But all of that information transfer, whether it's reading a chapter or watching a lecture, that happens before the live class time. It's valuable to have everyone together, this teacher and the students together. That's valuable time. That's gold. And what do you spend it on? Not the teacher just saying a bunch of words at the students but rather the students doing things to apply that knowledge, practice that knowledge um, with each other. 
So um, at this point uh, in the in the class, uh, I reveal, uh, oh, the, the title of this book is Victory. Uh, and then I asked the students that that's kind of an odd name, um, don't you think? And, um, you know, uh, all of them suddenly put up X's like, yeah, you know, I asked them, like, put up a check mark if you think that name fits and an X if that name doesn't seem to fit the picture. Um, and I was just looking at this sea of X's uh, on all of their video feeds because, yeah, that's a surprising title for this book. And so then we spent some time discussing um, the title of this book and why the author might have chosen that to appeal to the audience they were trying to get to read their book. At this point, things are going to radically change in what I'm showing you because the students are about to go into breakout rooms. So far, it's been me and these 16 or 17 students all together in this big classroom. But usually each 50 minute session of a Minerva class will have at least one time where the students go into smaller groups to work with each other towards some goal. And what we'll do as we watch this video, and I'll scroll forward on it, is we're now looking at one of the particular breakout groups. So instead of seeing me and 17 students, we're seeing just these four students. And then there's three or so other breakout rooms with different students in them. And sometimes the different rooms will be doing a different activity. Uh, so for example, here, this group is analyzing this book cover. Other groups are analyzing other book covers. And all of the groups are answering standard questions about them. And I can be listening in on the group, seeing who needs help. They can raise their hands. I'll come visit. Um, but eventually, we're done with these breakout rooms. And we come back together um, and discuss some of what happened. So here we're back together as a big class. Uh, you can see that uh, someone has just uh, done something awesome because Brittany has given a, a snap and we can see up here uh, in the top bar, the third person uh, from the left is also snapping. Um, and we're seeing here the notes um, that this other group took on their book cover uh, in their breakout room. So uh, we discuss these different book covers and these different uh, things that the students were thinking about them. They're debating with each other. They're asking each other questions. And eventually, um, we get to some final poll. Uh, everyone answers it. And then we start discussing some of their answers. Uh, and that's the end of a 15-minute session. That's just one example. Um, there's all sorts of other activities I could show you, uh, maybe as discussion continues, um, where students are in a science class uh, working with numbers in a spreadsheet, uh, or they're in a geometry class working with angles, um, and all sorts of different ways that the activities work. Uh, but hopefully this gives you a sense of the core, what does it look like to be in a Minerva classroom? Uh, as Caprice highlighted for me, super important that it's a flipped classroom. Um, you've started with the foundational information beforehand, and then you get to practice it, apply it, combine it with other information, use it in new contexts um, with the expert teacher there uh, helping along the way, uh, moderating the discussion, uh, stepping in if there are confusions. Um, and I, I realized I haven't said at any point, um, this really is based on the science of learning. Um, that's why I find this exciting. That's what I research uh, as, as a scientist myself. Um, and Minerva's doing it. Um, it keeps on getting better. Um, and I'm super excited to, you know, I've shown you one chunk of it. There's so much more to show you. Um, oh, let me ask you a bunch of questions. because Yes, please. Because some of these things are things that I had questions about as we were building this partnership and they're things that made me super excited. Um, when I say the bubble chart, you know what I'm referring to? Can you bring up the bubble chart? Um, oh, yes, um, I will. I, I'll actually bring this into where I'm currently sharing my screen. Um, and um, let's see here. Uh, it's it's not currently in terms of bubbles, but I believe uh, this is. This is exact no, but this is the this is right. what I call the bubble chart. Yeah, I think it's really important for parents um, and students to to see this. In in a traditional public school, you know, you're showing up for class sometime between seven and eight thirty, 
and you're ending your day maybe sometime between two and four and maybe having a sports program after school. And it takes a lot of in-person time. And if you're like most college prep students, you're going home after you've had, you know, after you've had your soccer team practice, you're grabbing a little bit of food and you're doing, you know, two to five, two to four hours of homework. So it's a lot of time. And, and what students who have moved to online programs have said is, wow, I get all this time back. I, I don't have to have all these passing periods and, um, and the forever lunch or the Lord of the Flies recess. And, and so they get uh, time is made much more efficient. And so what, um, what this chart shows basically is that the Minerva program has four main subject areas, which are the same kinds of subject areas that any traditional high school would have, science, social studies, literature, and math. And, um, and those courses are gonna be grade specific to, um, to the student. And, um, and then there's also a personal skills course, which is really all about what we call executive functioning skills. Some people call them study skills, but these are things like, how do you manage your time? Um, how do you work in a group session? Uh, how do you communicate effectively? Wow, what does problem solving look like? Those are the personal skills. And, um, and so the actual time that students are in class over the course of a week in the Minerva program is, um, is four and a half, sorry, um, two hours a day, four days a week, and one hour a day, one day a week for the core program. And then, um, and that's what you see kind of across the top in the light colors. And then, um, and then in the bottom, the answer is that the Minerva program as we're implementing it through Stanza is whatever the student needs. So say the student is taking geometry as part of their Minerva core, um, I'm gonna make sure that the students who need one-on-one -on -one tutoring are getting one-on-one -on -one tutoring for their geometry. The students that, um, that wanna move faster than geometry and maybe do geometry and trig in the same year can get that done. We're customizing the wraparound on your own time piece to match exactly what the students need. And if we go back to the kid that I started with, that, that, that Roxy kid who is both bright and artistic and dyslexic, we're going to make sure that that student is getting really intensive um, reading and literacy training at the same time as higher order, high level critical thinking and creative thinking skills. Um, and then in addition to this, most of the stanza students are taking either a world language or a fine art or an elective related to a passion that they have so that by the time they complete the Minerva baccalaureate, they have also completed all of the requirements to get into any university in the world that they would choose to want to get into. Awesome. Um, I'm wondering what the next best thing to show everyone is because you know time is short and I'm so excited to share so many things. I'm thinking that showing everyone how the feedback system works. That is, makes every yeah. kid know that is how how am I going to get graded right? yes and the first thing and the first thing that we have to say is well actually there are two reasons why one would get graded one reason for getting graded is so that colleges and universities and your parents know how you did um but the in some ways the more important um reason for getting feedback is so that you can know concretely ways to improve and when you did something really well how to make sure you don't give up on the piece that you did really well, right? So you know not just what you can improve on and how, but what to not to, what to not stop doing because it's really good. So that's a, tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when I'm talking to an audience of um, my uh, my teaching and learning uh, scientist colleagues, I would I would call those two things summative feedback. You know, how are you doing? What goes on the transcript? And formative feedback. Um, and keeping these two things separate is a totally key thing about learning effectively. And so here what I'm showing everyone 
is the way the uh, grading and feedback system works in Minerva's forum for helping everyone learn, giving them that feedback that tells them what are you doing great, uh, what might you improve on. And so after each class is done, the teacher can go in to the class recording. And every single poll that the students have filled out something for is here. Um, so for example, these are the uh, titles uh, for, that, uh, for that book cover that we saw um, and what audience uh, people were trying to direct them towards. And then here is the video um, of the class session. And I, as the teacher, can go in and leave a score and a comment on any of these things. And usually you would just receive one score and one comment uh, per day, usually on whatever would be most helpful for you learning. Um, so if there's some part of the class that your teacher saw where they think, wow, that was great, and I really want to make sure you uh, see how it was great and the more general ideas about how you might apply this elsewhere, that might be what you get a great score uh, and some comment on. Um, alternatively, there might be some place where you had some misunderstanding. And that's where the teacher wants to go in and say, oh, uh, hold on, here's where you have some misunderstanding. Um, and let me uh, help explain to you uh, what, what you should have been doing here. And importantly for the thing that you might be concerned about, which is those transcript grades, you know, what helps you get into college later, especially in year one of the program, the weight of the scores is super low because the goal is just to be giving you that initial foundational learning. Um, so let me show you what this looks like. Um, let's say here on the polls, um, here we have um, Brittany's answer, uh, her title and the audience. And I might go ahead and add an assessment to this on hashtag audience, that was the topic of the day. And I can choose anything between a one and a four. Maybe I'll choose a three. You know, it was pretty good. And I say, um, this answer was great because, and then I fill in something there. Um, one way you could have improved it was to, and then I fill in some more information there. And then later when Brittany is looking at her scores, she can see not just the score that she got, but also my comment um, and exactly what it was on. And she can even do this a class across classes. Any class where she's received a score on this concept, whether it's this English literature class or a chemistry class or a math class, she could pull up, I want to see all of my scores on audience and see where I'm doing well and where I'm running into trouble. And the same thing is true on the videos. So here, for example, I'll, uh, I'll filter this down. Um, to where we're just uh, seeing responses from Brittany. Um, and uh, here I might watch this video of Brittany talking about someone's answer. Uh, and after I've reviewed this and go, oh yeah, that was good. Again, I can leave a comment on this. You know, maybe she did a great job here. I'll leave a four. This was, this was great because, and then I fill in some information there. Um, and when she sees this comment, she will be able to also see exactly this point in the video um, and refer back to this in order to really understand the feedback that I'm giving. Now, Mark, we, we got to do the mind blown piece of this, right? And the mind blown piece of this for me was when I think back to how almost every high school in the country does grading, basically say you've got an algebra class and it lasts 18 weeks and you've got quizzes at the beginning and quizzes all the way through. And ultimately, in order to get a good grade on the last quiz, you have to have learned the stuff that came before it or you wouldn't be successful on that last grade, uh, right? And, and yet, say I was on a, a little slow start and not maybe doing my homework or having some confusion. And in the first four weeks of the course, I got a lot of C's and D's and fails. But by the end of the course, I've mastered factoring and I can solve for X and I'm getting A's and B's, but I'm still gonna wind up with a C in the course because I had trouble at the beginning. I, so that just never seemed fair to me, you know? And I know Minerva solves this challenge. Yeah, 
Um, and some of it is as easy as the scores that you get near the beginning are just worth less. Um, the scores that you get early on, everything is a score between one and four. The first score you ever get from Minerva, the last score you ever get from Minerva, it'll be a one, a two, a three, or a four. But when they're being averaged together into what you would report to a college um, or what shows up on your transcript, the later scores on the bigger assignments where you're finally using these concepts to really try to achieve different goals that you have for some project you've selected you want to do, those are the scores that are worth a lot. These early scores are just, are like 99% just to help you. Uh, see, you see that you- This is huge, right? Because, and I've already yeah. been having conversations with some admissions officers at colleges and universities, and they're saying, oh, Dr. Young, this is great because I actually know what the student's level of understanding is now that they're coming to me, as opposed to what their level of understanding was back when. Because ultimately what a college admissions officer cares about is not, you know, how did you do in ninth grade? What they care about is when you're graduating from 12th grade, are you prepared to be successful in the college? And, and, so, and so having things count for more, the more advanced you get, makes so much sense. And yeah. it, it, it makes sense to the students, but it also makes a lot more sense to the admissions officers, which is why Minerva is, a great path to college. And it also gives us the freedom to actually give people useful feedback. If the student who is doing the best with a concept, the first time it's introduced, needs to be getting 100% on it uh, for that later, you know, showing a college transcript, that student isn't getting useful feedback. Um, you're being told, oh, you're doing great for a ninth grader. Uh, here's your A plus. And that's not actually useful compared to here's what you did really well here. Here's where you have room for improvement in the following ways. But also don't worry, uh, the fact that we've indicated this is not as strong as this, you know, you did great here, you did a little bit less well here, that's not tanking your college admissions. That's just helpful feedback for you to learn so that by the time you are doing those final big assignments and by the time you are applying, to college, you really are very, very strong on all of these different concepts. See, and there's a related thing too that is important about the Stanza Minerva partnership on this baccalaureate is that when my, when my teachers are teaching in the Minerva baccalaureate, the focus of the teaching time is only two hours a day. And what that gives them is a ton of time to be participating one-on-one -on -one with individual students. So one of my teachers can say, um, send an email or make a phone call or send a text to a student after class saying, it seemed like you were having some challenges with this one concept. How about if we hop on the phone later today and I'll go over it with you. That kind of one-on-one -on -one tutoring, it, it, it's what I would describe as kind of just-in-time tutoring is, is really what makes it even more meaningful, right? So kids are not gonna be struggling forever. You know, I, um, I also wanna make sure that we're um, talking about that color coding thing, Mark. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Right, so, so one of the things that has been in the press a lot lately is the, the word equity, right? And, and equity is all about fairness. It's all about making sure that every student is being treated fairly. And I can guarantee you, almost every student has had the experience of either getting called on when they weren't ready or not getting called on when they were. And, you know, teachers are not always unbiased in who they favor or who they provide talk time to. And this color coding thing was a, another one of the mind blow things for me as an educator. Looking yes. At Let me see if I can, uh, I will, I will quickly, um, attempt to, to find, uh, I'll stop my screen share for a moment. Um, and, uh, and I'll try to find this while I describe it, um, which is as the teacher in a Minerva class, you can at any time press the letter T 
on your keyboard. Um, and then everyone's video feed gets color coded in one of three colors. Uh, one color means this person has spoken a lot, uh, maybe way too much, you know, more than their fair share. Another color means great, this is kind of on target. And another color means uh, this student uh, hasn't spoken as much as, as they might. Um, and that helps you as a teacher see who you might call on uh, at different times. Um, and way better than your biased perceptions about who you might call on. We know, uh, based on a lot of research, uh, that on average, both male and female teachers are more likely to call on male students who have their hand raised compared to female students. Uh, but here, you can just actually be tracking that. Um, and I'll go ahead and I will share uh, my screen again uh, to show what this looks like uh, from the teacher's perspective. Um, portion of the screen. And it looks, uh, it looks like this. Um, so you can see the two students in blue uh, have greater than average talk time. The one student in green, uh, green is, is kind of good, but it also means go, you know, call on that student. Uh, and this is demonstrating this just with, you know, three students. Uh, but if there are more students here, maybe one of them would appear in orange, you know, orange danger. The student is in danger of not having been engaged as much as the other students. Well, um, the other cool thing about this is that um, sometimes students will be given a quote participation grade in a traditional public school. And, and it's based on you know, the whole semester the teacher going, yeah, I remember that student participated some. Or if you've got a really meticulous teacher, maybe they're checking uh, and making hash marks each time a student inter interacts in school. But this is actually really super data driven in ways that um, that allow the teacher to look at the real information, but also the student as well. Absolutely. And um, I I'll just compare with my own teaching, right? Because I, I don't feel as bad uh, criticizing myself uh, compared to other people. I will criticize myself uh, as a teacher before I started teaching with Minerva. Um, I taught plenty of classes where uh, it was a discussion-based class, you know, that was nice and fun. Um, and students' grades were based on maybe one or two big papers and participation. And, you know, what does that mean? It, it, it meant I looked through a paper and I was like, this is an A minus, you know, or this is a B plus. And I put a grade on the paper and I maybe put a few comments. And I think, how much did I like this student's participation in class? And I, you know, put a score on that. And then that was their grade for the semester. Um, and that's just terrible, uh, this way that I was approaching things um, for student learning. Uh, the fact that with the Minerva approach, you're getting consistent feedback on specific concepts. Here's what you did well with this concept. Here's where you can improve. The fact that your participation in class is not just how much did your teacher remember you as saying things that they liked, um, but can actually be data driven. Um, helps these scores be both more accurate and more useful uh, for everyone's learning. So I need to switch us over to um, answering questions. We only have about 10 minutes left and, um, and I wanna make sure that we at least get a couple questions in. Um, so one of the questions is, my student wants to take AP classes. Is this possible? Will he be in the Minerva program with other AP students? Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, so the Minerva part is the engagement part that Mark's been describing, um, and it's complemented by what we describe as the, um, the personalized learning piece of it. And so a student is very likely to be in a math course with, um, with a variety of students that are in the Minerva portion. Some of those math students are going to be, say, um, taking AP calculus and um, eventually it won't be their ninth grade year in most cases, but some will. <laughs> and um, actually I can think of one offhand who probably is gonna be doing AP calculus at the same time as Minerva ninth grade. But, um, but what, we will, what we do is we make sure that the content and the support and the coursework that the students are getting um, is tailored to what their individual desires are. So a student can participate in Minerva at the same time as also preparing to take AP exams. 
and and what we do is we'll replace some of the normal assignments in an AP course with the Minerva assignments and it's all aligned so that when we get to May of next year and the student is sitting for that AP course they're going to ace it they're going to get their five because we've given them the support that they need and prepared them for that AP test. Um, another also um, question that we have here is, can you explain the amount of time a student will spend doing Minerva work each day or week? Um, time with the teacher in class, doing homework, other activities. How can it be just two hours a day? Um, so the, um, the two hours a day is the in-class time with their cohort and their teacher. You can expect that every student is going to be spending between three and six hours in addition to that, depending on the student, what courses they're taking, what other courses they're taking in addition to the Minerva core, and also what kind of help they need. Um, in a traditional public school kind of environment, everybody's getting 47 minutes of each course every single day, most of the time. And you know, some kids really need to spend three hours on math and maybe a little less time on social studies. And so what this allows us to do is to tailor that down um, and have them concentrating their time most effectively. So, well, I'd love to give you an answer that says every kid is gonna be spending six hours a day. The truth is every kid is going to be spending at least two hours a day that are that are going to be standardized times with other students and teachers but then the rest of their schedule is going to be completely flexible and tailored to that individual student and in so, with some students they won't spend another minute with a teacher because they're going to do it all asynchronously synchronously on their own and that's how they like to work and that's how they're successful but with others I, it I, might be a combination i i would love to just interject my own high school experience here um, in which there were classes where I was excited by the content, I enjoyed it, I, I, I was good at it, um, and I, I came into class, you know, already basically knowing the content. You know, I'd already read the psychology textbook, I was prepared for the psychology lecture, um, and then I was, I was actually bored. Like, that was wasted time, um, because I, I already knew this content that the teacher was lecturing. Um, meanwhile, there were other classes I went into where it was also not useful time spent sitting there listening to the lecture because I wasn't understanding it. Um, and having the flexibility to move more swiftly through the content that you're prepared to move swiftly through and spend more time on the content that you need that additional help with um, during the non-forum aspects. Uh, again, this two hours uh, a day is just these activities in forum where you've come in, you've successfully mastered the basics, and now you're going to be applying, playing with them, using them across contexts. Um, that's the bit that's only two hours a day. Right. Well, and, and um, you know, kids are different, right? I mean, some students love social interaction and they want to get into the um, dialogue and the discussion. Some students are more reticent. Some students actually need in-person content right, or in-person interaction. And one of the things that, um, that we do at Stanza is we recognize that your education isn't just what happens in the online forum. So we work with parents to do things like plan for in-person activities that might be where they are. So we have a student, for example, who lives in the Philippines and um, her PE class is that she's a scuba diver. And so we're working with her parents to, to document that she, has, uh, she did her scuba certification and is doing her scuba diving and we're giving her PE credit for that scuba diving. You know, for other, for other students, they're participating in club sports and they want more time for those club sports and they wanna get credit for it. For some students, they may wanna take say a photography course that requires in-person in whatever city they happen to, you know, to live in. And um, that's, totally cool. That's great. So then they're going to be doing a combination of uh, a very tailored physical in-person experience where they live combined with an on-person, an, you know, an online um, program. The, the big difference here is that we don't think about online as somebody staring at a screen. We think about online really more as um, that screen is a window to the world. 
And we use the technology as a window to the world. And what we find is that sometimes those very reticent students through the Minerva program, they become much more engaged. They learn how to engage and, uh, and lose that fear. And some of those students that maybe walk into it with like, they've got to be the first person to talk in every class and they learn how to listen. And both of those skills are really important to creating confident learners that going back to the beginning now that really own their education. I'm also getting a note here from one of our teachers who happens to be on the line and, and uh, Mr. Fergal is saying, Minerva is very teacher friendly. Would you please comment on this? Um, and um, so um, Mark, if you could just say a moment about the teacher friendliness. Yeah, um, I, I think about it as giving me the tools to actually do my job better, more easily than I possibly could be doing otherwise. Um, and I'll go back to the 30 second story I started with, which is I heard about Minerva, I thought it was too good to be true based on the description. And so I tried it out for a semester. And so there was a semester in which I was teaching Yale students in person and I was teaching some Minerva University college students uh, in Minerva's forum. And what sold me on switching uh, full time the next year was that there was not a single moment when I was with my Minerva students, when I thought, wow, this would be so much better if I was around a big wooden table with them in person. That, that just never crossed my mind. But all the time with my Yale students in a physical classroom, I wished that I was in Minerva's forum able to have those tools. And one of them that uh, Caprice suggested uh, I show, and then I did, um, was the fact that there's talk time. Who am I going to call on? You know, so many people have their hands raised or, or no one has their hands raised. You know, maybe it's time for me to, to nudge someone. You know, what do you think? Um, the fact that I can have the system just tell me, here are the people who haven't spoken uh, today uh, or very much. Um, also the fact that there's all of these activities built in um, and Minerva teachers, uh, they, they're expert teachers uh, doing their job. Uh, they're not robots following a script, but there's a lot of options built into the buffet uh, for every day of what activities are you going to do? What questions might you ask their students? They're to support you and give you that help. Likewise, giving students feedback. I'm not just scribbling you know, notes in the margin of a paper or you know, leaving comments on a Word document or something like that. I'm actually engaging with them in the answers they gave in class, um, really helping them see what they did and how they can be improving. These are just a small number of, exa of examples because we're so short on time, um, but just over and over again, um, it allows me to do the job I want to be doing um, and making it both easier and more efficient for me to do it. Okay. Well, I wanna wrap us up um, and thank you so much for spending this time with us. One of the questions that came up was, you know, what, what kind of student is the right student for a Stanza Minerva Baccalaureate? And um, that's actually an interesting question. I think I wanna turn it around a little bit and say, well, what kind of student is the right kind of student for a traditional in-person education? And the kind of student that's gonna do well in a traditional in-person education is a student who is um, verbal, who is going to engage in class, who is extremely organized and can manage all of their homework time outside of class, um, and who understands how to please teachers. Um, now, that's an important kind of kid. And, um, and I went to college with a lot of those students, and I send a lot of students to college with those skill sets. The thing about Minerva and this Minerva Baccalaureate is that it works with a much broader range of learners, right? So a student can come into um, a Minerva Baccalaureate program very reticent, and the teacher is going to learn the strengths that that student has 
they're not going to be trying to change the student. What they're going to be doing is finding those strengths, building on those strengths, and engaging that student so that that student becomes a confident learner in their own learning style. Likewise, um, a student may, may be absolutely um, task oriented and focus, 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 focused. Yeah, that kid is going to do great in a, in a Minerva environment. And they're going to learn some creative thinking skills that, um, that will be the envy of the next generation. Because ultimately, what we're doing is we are educating students for a world in which there is intense uh, uncertainty, where the jobs they hold probably haven't even been, in, been invented yet, right? Um, where what is going to be valuable is going to be the student's ability to think creatively and to, um, to think critically and to communicate and engage effectively. And, and those are the human beings that are going to thrive in, in this world in the next generation. And so what I would say is that the students who want to do that, those are the students who are the Minerva students. And um, mostly what I would like to just impart is that we would consider it our greatest honor for you to trust us with the education of your students. We, we understand deeply what a big commitment that you would be making to trust us with the education of your students and we will not let you down. And uh, we, we've, we've worked so hard to make sure that it's perfect and we know that your students are working that hard too because they only get one high school education. And that high school education is gonna set them up for a lifetime of success. And we want those students 20 years from now to look back and say, my Stanza Minerva Baccalaureate is when I started to be incredibly successful and it's only gotten better. So thank you very much for spending time with us. And I hope that you have an awesome rest of your week. Take care.